Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to All Together, the Family Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Now, let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode. We have previously clarified that a household can be formed in so many different ways. Some homes exist to provide a level of care that children need. Foster care is a type of out of home care for children who can't live on their own with their own families and are needing a specific type of guidance that are neglected by other guardians. Dr. John DeGarmo is leading foster care expert, author, speaker on different platforms, including TED Talk and Fox News. He's here today to talk about how a family functions with the introduction of foster children. Thank you so much for joining me today, John. My pleasure. Thank you. So talking about foster families and foster care, it's such a broad, specific topic when you're talking about how a family is supposed to function, like we're talking about how to introduce foster children with your own children as well. And that's something that we don't usually talk about in terms of what foster care is. You usually talk about it's two um, two parents, two people who are in, in a relationship or a single parent who's going ahead and fostering children. So it's very unusual to usually talk about and hear about the blending of both biological and foster children? Well, it's all my children have really known. You know, we've been a foster family for 20 plus years. My oldest child is 25. So for them, it's my kids, it's their norm. It's Mm -hmm. their norm having extra siblings, extra brothers and sisters in the home. Mm -hmm. No, that's amazing. So what got you into, I mean, not only talking about foster care, but also being a foster parent yourself? Well, it all goes back to my time when I was living in Australia. We were living in Great Keppel Island, um, and our first child died of a condition called anencephaly, or some pronounce it anencephaly. It's a condition where the brain or skull doesn't truly form, and my wife was in labor for 92 hours. Wow. Uh, my wife's from Devo. Uh, and then years later, we moved back to the U.S., and I was teaching in a very, very rural part of the country, and I noticed a lot of kids coming through my high school classroom who had issues of behavior and attendance and academics. And I kept thinking, what is wrong? These children, what's going on? What's going on? And then I met a lot of their families and I recognized, aha, it really starts in the family. It really starts in the family. So I went to my wife and said, hey, you know, we lost our first child. We've, we've had three healthy children since then. There's a lot of children in my classroom who are struggling, who need, who, who are, who need help. And one of those kids was pregnant with triplets. And I recognized it was not going to be a good a good um, outcome. So that led to foster parenting. That led to 60 plus kids who come through our home. Wow. That's no, that's an incredible way, an inspiring way in order to start. It's such an emotional connection to, to so many kids, because especially as you're teaching them, you're seeing them, how they go and how their performance is. So it's amazing that you were able to take them under your wing and really support them in, in a really intimate way. Well, you know, it's family. And these, there's, in my house, there's no label, there's no biological, there's no adoptive, there's no foster. They're mm-hmm. all part of our family. No, that's that's an amazing way to define it. And especially talking about on a family podcast, it's it's amazing to sort of see that that's what your definition of family is. Um, sure. and, that, and that definition is always changing because we're all, there's children coming in and out of the house, in and out of the house. Um, so, you know, family for us looks probably different than many different families. We've had as many as 11 children in our house at the same time, very different colors. Uh, so, again, it's something that's always changing and evolving, but what a wonderful blessing it is, too. 
Yeah, no, it sounds it sounds like an incredible job and for you to be able to take even a few kids, I think for me that's always that's always a really good thing. I think a lot of kids need a lot of support um, in so many different ways, not only a roof over their head, but the emotional support of just being there as well. So, no, that's incredible to see. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we get started, we love to start with a little icebreaker. It's called, Have You Met John? And it's just a little get to know you a little bit more before we dive into the topic. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So when I say these questions, just say the first thing that comes to your head. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> So the first one is a favorite book of yours. The Bible. Okay. Yep. No, I I can see that. I can understand that. And that was a quick that was a quick jump. So that's the perfect book. You know, I was going to say I got a lot of books behind me too. So I, I love to read all different <laughs> genres, but uh, you know that's the one I pick up every day. Yep. No, that's perfect. Um, how about your favorite movie? Oh dear. Um, <laughs> I would say the 1941 version of The Wolfman starring Bar uh, Bela Lugosi and Lon Chaney Jr. Okay. I think I've only seen that a couple of times. So, yes, I, I can see. I think that's that's pretty cool. Pretty cool movie to see as your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I like the classic films. Okay. Perfect. How about a favorite podcast of yours? Well, I had my own for several years, uh, Parenting Factors with Dr. John. I like that one. But I, I, I listen now to a couple, probably it's probably three I listen to. I listen to um, Monster Kid Radio. Again, my love of classic horror films. I listen mm -hmm. to the X-22 Report. Um, probably, and, and maybe a couple others. But those are the two I listen to on a regular basis. Okay. Well, I love the, I love the classic horror film genre that you are, I, I think... Um, my dad and I, we both share the love of that. And we have a little marathon once every season. I think it, we just go through a whole lot of them. So, no, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so how about a famous role model that you have? Um, good. And my wife, to be sure. Mm -hmm. It's probably probably the paramount one. Um, role models. Um Abraham Lincoln was an amazing individual. I like Ronald Reagan, Jesus Christ. Um, but my wife probably is the one that stands out. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. Amongst all the other people that you've chosen, I think it's amazing that you've chosen your wife, especially with the amount of work that you guys do together uh, when it comes to foster care. So, no, that's, I think she would appreciate that choice as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, how about a favorite course that you've completed? Are you, you mean back in my history, uh, back in my college days? Yeah, or anything, anything that you've done up till now as well. It can be a smallest course that sort of really changed your perspective. It could be anything. Oh, well, gosh, you know what I do is I conduct training sessions across the globe on foster care. So I'm always learning as I, as I'm researching and developing those courses, I'm always learning. Um, but back in college, I guess I really enjoyed history of film was really neat. I did, uh, I did a lot of radio back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, probably that. Well, that's that's a pretty cool course. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty cool one. Now, going into the questions that we're talking about today, we love to start off with um, a very familiar question to everyone. And I think we spoke about this a little bit earlier. But what do you think? defines a family well you know i think the definition is different for really everybody what my family looks like is certainly different than my parents that i grew up with. and it's certainly different than my sister it's certainly different than my mother-in-laws um so i think family is is a group of people that love you support you um are there for you that you can count on that you can look for for support again you know, for our family, it's 60 plus kids. We've adopted three from foster care. We've had uh, so many kids come through our home over the years. So, you know, I think family is different for each person and family changes as well over time. No, I, I think this definition is pretty universal with a lot of other guests that have come through on the show talking about just 
just having a connection with somebody is what can call you call call a family. So I think it's um for me, I think there's a very set definition already. It's just we don't see it as a really biological definition of what it is. So I can definitely agree with that. So what do you think the position of a family holds in today's society? Well, I think we're seeing the breakdown of families. Um, you know, that's why, well, here in the United States, you've got 5 million children who experience domestic violence in their homes every single year. You have uh, 800,000 children who are missing. You have 300,000 children who are victims of human trafficking. These children are coming from broken families. These children are coming from families that are in hurting, that are in pain, that are dysfunctional in some way. Uh, there's a reason why my wife and I have brought so many kids into our own family because their families were suffering in some way. So I think that we're seeing, sadly, a breakdown of family, as family changes, we're seeing the breakdown of that traditional family, if you will. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's disturbing, if you will. You know, I, I, I wish I didn't have the business of the Foster Care Institute, because that means every child is living in a supportive, unconditionally loving family. But sadly, that's not the case. No, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. Do you think that it still holds the same importance of a family as it did maybe 10, 20 years ago? I do not think so. I do not think so. I think that um, it's rapidly changing, um, and I think some of that is due to online technology and social media, if you will. I think so many people are, are influenced by that. Um, both positive and negative, but yeah, family. I think I think the, the the idea of family has been under attack, if you will, for for a number of years now, sadly. Um, and it's the children who really suffer as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why do you think why do you think it's changed so much? I mean, other than the social media, like you were explaining a bit before, but I mean, there must be some kind of huge impact that kids are sort of seeing. Like we talk about estrangement you talk about different ways that families can sort of go astray why do you think that it changes so quickly well let's look back to that first statistic i gave you five million children experiencing domestic violence in their own house when their mothers and their fathers inside their family so mm -hmm. their view of a family is going to be very very different than mine so when they become adults and they have children you know they're going to have a very different outlook of a family perhaps they might uh, push back against the idea of a family because, they, again, they came from a family that was so abusive. Um, you've got 300,000 children in the United States who are victims of human trafficking. So their vision and version and idea of a family is so different than a traditional setting. Um, in this post-COVID world, you've got 70% increase in teenage suicide here in the United States. And we're facing what I think the real pandemic Forget the virus. I was more concerned about the mental health aspects of of, yeah. of it for the children than of any virus. Um, and we're seeing the results of that today. And I think that all impacts family. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about fostering and talking about sort of taking kids out of difficult situations that they, I mean, we all can agree that they shouldn't be involved in in the first place. And you're putting them into a home that similar to yours, where it's full of care, where it's full of providing needs that um, are needing to be met. How would you define what fostering is? Foster care is providing a place of stability, structure, and unconditional love for a child in crisis. Uh, and that is, that's done throughout, and, and while that's happening, while a child in foster care is being placed into foster home, the birth parents are trying to um, learn their own parenting skills, if you will, and heal from their own pain, their own suffering, their own mental health issues, if you will. So foster care really is placing a child into a place of stability, structure, safety um, while they're in crisis. Mm -hmm. And talking about foster families, what kind of responsibilities do they have for the children as well. I mean, it's not like they get to fully, I think, keep them in their house. There's sort of like a temporary situation. So what kind of 
temporary responsibility do they have for for the children? The same as your own child in regards to your providing structure, stability, safety, nurturing, um, consistency, um, healthy diets, help with education and school. You know, again, as I said earlier, these are my children. So they're going to have every single type of opportunity that I can provide for my own children. So when a child is placed in my home, yes, I'm going to provide that stability and that structure and that unconditional love. And I'm also going to give, hopefully introduce them to other opportunities like band camps, boarding events, music, music, things like that, just like I would my own children. Um, and, you know, we we are raising these children. But you said temporary. And that's 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 the focus. It is the focus. Child is not supposed to be in foster care for forever. Hopefully they'll only be for a short time. The end goal of foster care is reunification, which means the child is reuni reunified with their birth parents. 50, that happens 50% of the time, sadly, which means 50% of the times it does not happen. And as a result, many children are stuck in the foster care system until they transition out of the age of 18 or 21 years of another in other states. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, as a, as a foster parent, my responsibility for that child is the same as it would be for my own children. Mm -hmm. Now, that's think... not to say that it's easy because many yeah. times these children are placed into my home. When they come to my home, or any foster parent's home, they're scared. They're afraid. They have questions like, why am I here? When do I go home? Did I do something wrong? Is it my fault I'm here? Do my parents not love me anymore? Uh, will I ever see mommy and dad again? Will these new people, will they hurt me? Uh, will they abandon me? Um, what are their rules like? Will they, are they nice? So they have all these unanswered questions those first few nights, and it's a very scary time. You can put aside all the abuse trauma and neglect they've experienced is a time of anxiety being placed into a foster care home. And many of these children have issues of trust. They have issues of attachment. They may have anger management issues or sleeping disorders or eating disorders or any type of other disorders or anxiety. So it can be challenging caring for those children in your home when quite simply they are, they don't trust you and they shouldn't. They shouldn't. Why should they trust me? Because I'm a stranger. So it takes them time to learn to trust me, like take some time to recognize that, you know what, that, that person is not going to hurt me. Maybe I'm going to be safe here. Maybe I'm going to be okay. And what are some of the ages that you've had um, for the foster children that have sort of come into your household? Are there varying ages? Could it be closer to sort of like the older ages of the 16 and onwards and when they're closer to sort of transitioning out of the foster care system? I've had him as young as 27 hours old. I had one that was five weeks premature and as old as 18 years of age and everything in between. I think back to a time we had seven in diapers at the same time. Wow. Uh, so we have had all age groups in our home, which makes mm -hmm. it interesting because it's never the same to be sure. Every child comes is going to bring their own wonderful gifts and their own unique challenges. Uh, you know, and, and every age group brings with it its own um, joys as well. Mm -hmm. And to be a foster parent, I know like a lot of, um, I've had this conversation with people in, um, people in my friend group when talking about adoption, talk about fostering and that kind of topics. And it's not something a lot of family, a lot of people are even considering as an option, which unfortunately is the case. Cause a lot of people are saying, I want biological kids. I want kids that are mine. And that's, for me, that's a scary idea. The fact that they have to define it like that, that they have to differentiate um, biological and fostering and adopted children and all that things. What topic, like, how do you talk about and discuss this with your partner or with other family members when you're considering to be a foster parent? Well, what you said there was so important. You have to discuss it with your partner and your spouse beforehand because you mm -hmm. both have to be on board. You both mm -hmm. have to be fully committed because if one person's committed and on board and the other one does not want to do it, you simply cannot do it because it takes both of you to do so. You know, you mm -hmm. don't have to be rich. You don't have to have a big house. You don't have to be married. Um, you just have to have really a heart to help children in crisis. And sadly, 
as we're having this discussion, there's a child right near where you live and right near where I live needs someone to step up and say, I'll help you. I'll, mm-hmm. help you. I'll be your family for the time being. Uh, but there are so many myths and misconceptions associated with foster care that kids are bad kids. It's not, the, it's not true. They are victims of abuse, neglect, abandonment. They're children in crisis. They're children who want uh, a normal type of lifestyle without being hurt. Mm. And I think in a way, media and like films really put the whole idea of fostering and adoption in such a bad light when they sort of describe how the kids are. And sometimes it is the case, but a lot of times it really isn't how it's more as an exaggerated view as to how children are. So it's, it's amazing that that's the kind of view, especially with the amount of, um, help that fostering foster care systems are needing it's turned into oh i don't want to have that kind of situation in my house and so how does that affect a lot of the systems that are in place when it comes to foster care well you're right the media presents a very very negative image about it one image that's oftentimes not true uh and that's one of the things i try to do is i try to bring awareness to these issues try to bring the realities of it try to break down those myths and misconceptions and bring instead awareness, because I think awareness equals advocacy. More people who are aware of what's really happening and why these children are really suffering, then their hearts might be opened up and say, you know what, maybe I could do it. Maybe I can help these kids. But you know, since there is such a negative perception about it, that's one of the reasons why there is such a need for foster parents across the globe, across the globe. Um, more children coming into a foster care system not enough foster parents. And uh, that's why so many child welfare programs and agencies across the globe struggle. Mm -hmm. And when talking about discussing it with the rest of the family members, you're saying everyone needs to be on board. Does that mean that the children that are already in the household also need to be on board with the situation? Oh, sure. And to be sure, Mm -hmm. we couldn't do that. Our own kids. Um, yeah, yeah, they would help with, you know, they would help with maybe playing the child, feeding the child, um, reading a book to the children. You know, again, they are my kids. They're their siblings. They're their they're their temporary siblings, if you will, and they form relationships with the kids. Is it always easy? No, it's not. Are there sometimes where it's it's uh, sometimes my own kids are struggling? Sure, yes, but we couldn't do it without our own kids. And sometimes we need to take a break. We sometimes will sit back and say, you know what, we need to circle the wagons, if you will, and maybe spend some t- own time or maybe um, spend some time grieving after a child's been with us for a long time leaves because that's like losing a member of our family so many times. Mm-hmm. So yes, it's it's important that our own kids are on board as well. And if they're not, then we can't do it. And how does that lead to a functioning family when talking about like the routine that goes on day to day, um, kids still need to go to school, like all of those different situations that come about how does that sort of function in terms of both the foster care foster kids and the um other family members in the household it's just organized chaos (laughs) um it's exhausting you know when you have but 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 what you said though was true you've got to have a you've got to have consistency and structure so it's very structured in our house you know we get up in the morning we get ready for school. We do X, Y, Z to get ready for school. After school, there is a schedule, there's a consistent schedule. The kids know what to expect in regards to snack time, homework time, play time, dinner time, bath time, book time, you know, read time, bedtime. So they have that structure um, so they can know what to expect. And to be sure, there's, there's times you got to be flexible, yes. But that structure, kids thrive on structure. They thrive on consistency. Um, and also, it just makes the family run smoother, if you will, as well. Everybody knows what to expect each day, and everybody can pitch right in. Mm-hmm. And now I think, like, talking about the challenges that sort of come about, um, other than the organized chaos that sort of comes around, what are some of the challenges that a family should anticipate when they decide to be a foster family? Well, to begin with, as I said earlier, you're gonna your heart's gonna break because when the, when these children come into your home, they need structure, they need stability. But with any more than anything else, 
is for someone to love them with all of their hearts unconditionally. So when they leave, for whatever reason it might be, our hearts break because we're losing a member in our family that we've loved so much. Now it could be a wonderful, what could be a wonderful ending for that child? They might go back to their birth family and have a happy ending ever after. But again, it's still, there is that hole in the heart. So they need to be prepared for that. You need to be prepared for the fact that these children are coming from a place of trauma. So foster parents need to be trauma informed. Um, and that, that training is really, really essential and critical for foster parents. So we can better address and help these kids when they're facing their anxieties from the trauma they've experienced. And trauma, of course, looks different for each child. So, it, you know, you've always got to be learning. You've got to have a lot of patience, understanding, compassion for these children. As I said earlier, they're going to come to our house and they're not going to trust us. They're not going to uh, help it quickly form a relationship with us because they're going to have those questions as they should. So that's when the patience comes in. We got to be patient with these children, understanding, listening, um, um, and flexible. But there, there are plenty of challenges. You know, when you have a child coming to your home who has issues of trust and attachment and some type of disorder, that can be difficult. It can be challenging. But the rewards are so are so wonderful. No, it's it sounds like an incredible journey. No matter how many challenges sort of come about, um. What things should a foster family, if you're going to be a foster family, what kind of things should you prepare beforehand? I mean, other than the training that sort of takes place um, and the emotion, um, emotional strength to be able to know that this is a temporary situation, what are some of the other things that should be prepared beforehand? You've got to have a support group of some kind. Mm-hmm. Uh, because no one really understands a foster parent like another foster parent. My friends, my family members, those closest to me, they never truly understand what it's like having children in crisis in our home 24 hours a day. Mm-hmm. So we have to have some type of support group where we can share ideas, we can cry with each other, we can laugh with each other, we can lean on each other's shoulders for help without somebody criticizing us or judging us or looking at us kind of odd because it's a very strange lifestyle. And it's a, foster parenting is a unique lifestyle. When you have a child in crisis in your house, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, it's a different type of family, if you will. So you've got to have that support group there where you can lean upon, learn from, um, get help from. That's critical. Um, you've got to make sure that, again, I mentioned earlier, your, your, your spouse, your partner, your family's on board, and then you just buckle up and get ready for a wild, wonderful adventure. Mm-hmm. And in terms of, um, other things, I know there's a lot of, um, cultural differences that can sort of take place in terms of when fostering, cause it doesn't matter. There's so many different cultures, so many different, um, set expectations as to how the child should be raised. You want them to also feel in their own community as well, no matter what race, no matter what religion, any kind of thing. So what kind of things did you expect and sort of prepare for that as well? My wife's from America. I'm from Australia. Our godparents for some of our children are from Germany and Switzerland. We've been all across the globe. We have friends on every different continent. We are always bringing into those, to our house, those different cultures. So for my family, it's the norm. Mm -hmm. It is the norm. You know, if you look in our cabinet, you're going to see a bunch of Vegemite. And we uh, see Mother's Day was yesterday. And my kids got my wife um, some, um, oh gosh, what is that stuff called? Well, um, she got them, they got some Australian snacks, Tim Tams and some other things. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, we, and, and we'll, and we celebrate Australia Day. We celebrate, you know, days in Europe as well. Um, so we're always bringing different cultures into the family. And I think it's great for the kids because they're introduced to so many different ideas, different experiences, um, different ways of looking at the world. Um, so that is important to recognize the ch- where the child's background from it is. Um, at the same time, introducing new ideas into the family. Um, I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about our family, I think it is, because we have such a deep cultural well to draw from. Mm-hmm. No, that sounds that sounds like a perfect blend of blend of a family, learning so many different things from each other, so many different life experiences as well. And 
I mean, these these children are amazing in their own way and have so many things that they can bring, so many things that they can teach um, other children as well. So it's like a whole big community in itself, I guess. Very much so, very much so. So how would adding a foster child into the family affect the family relationships um, of other children in the house, whether it's other foster children, other um, biological children? How would that, um, just adding someone else there sort of create conflict or does it sort of fit in in its own way? Well, the family dynamics are always going to change because the oldest might no longer be the oldest. The youngest might not be the youngest anymore. You know, an mm-hmm. only child might suddenly have three extra siblings in the house the next day. So the family dynamics are changing and you have to adapt to that. You've got to be flexible in that regard. You've got to be understanding. Um, and, you know, so when a child is, when we get the phone call for a child from foster be placed in our home, we have a number of questions. We have to determine very quickly, is this child a good fit for our family? Is our family a good fit for this child? And can we provide the support services uh, that this child needs right now? And sometimes that answer is no. Sometimes it might not be a good fit for our family, or sometimes our family might not be a good fit for that child. So sometimes we need to say no to that placement, which means there is a better family. There's a family that's going to be better equipped for that child. Mm-hmm. So we take that into account. You know, when we get that phone call, where is our family? Uh, where is our own family at right now um, in regards to mental health issues and that type of thing? Um, so there are some times when we might say, you know what, this might not be the best time, the best fit for our, for our family at this time. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like there's a good system in place where it's every family member is sort of having their needs met in different ways and you're still taking the time. I mean, it must be very difficult for both you and your wife to be able to have that um, time to spend on each child individually when there's so many children in the house. So how do you balance that part as well? Because it's something that's it's baffling me as to how, I mean, I've got two parents and it's just me and my sister and there's such a, and they're having trouble even understanding how, we work and knowing what's going on in our life. So how do you balance knowing so many different children at the same time? You know, I think it begins with, it starts with priorities. Where are your priorities lay? Do your priorities lay with your work or with your family? Does your priority Mm -hmm. lie with your phone and social media or with your children? So we have placed our priority on our family and our children. Does that mean it's easier? Probably not. Um, you know, so we, we struggle to find time for not only the children, but for each other and for ourselves. A lot of foster parents struggle with self-care because they're giving all of themselves to these children in crisis and nothing to themselves. And they might sink into depression or burnout or compassion fatigue, which is not a secondary traumatic stress. So it is a juggling act, if you will. You just have to carve out time. Foster parenting is also a lifestyle of sacrifices. You know, my wife and I just can't go off to the movie theaters and wherever we want to or out to dinner at the drop of a hat because we have children placed in our home who need us. So it is, again, where are your priorities and what type of sacrifices are you like, making a way, uh, willing to make for your family? Mm-hmm. And can you explain what are some of the characteristics that sort of take place in a functional foster family? What do you mean by characteristics? Like the different, I think in the way, like there's not only like talk about the well-being of each child. What are some of the systems that you sort of have in place that create such a huge uh, family function within the family that you have? Well, I said earlier, my wife and I are both fully on board. So it takes both of us to, to make these things happen. But sometimes I will rely on her a little bit more and she'll rely upon me a little bit more. Um, but we we made the commitment a long time ago that our first priority is these children. Um, so our family and our household is built around that. Mm-hmm. You know, our work schedules are built around that. Our vacation schedules are built around that. Our entertainment is built around that. Our, our meals 
are built around that. My wife's a doctor in nutrition, naturopathic medicines and nutrition. So we're making sure that always the children are always getting healthy diets and things like that. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it, but again, it looks different for every family. Mm-hmm. So how do you go and sort of deal with each situation of the child that sort of comes to your house? How do you handle children that sort of don't see this as a good fit for them and have a little bit of time adjusting especially like you see like the only place that I sort of see foster families is in film unfortunately that's the only place that I have as a reference but children that sort of leave the foster homes and go try to go back to there and run away and try in different situations how do you deal with that um with that gaining of trust of that particular child that's where the patience comes in because mm-hmm. when they come to my house, I recognize it's going to take them a while to learn to trust me. It's going to take them a while to recognize that we're not going to hurt them. We're not going to abandon them. We're not going to yell at them or scream at them or belittle them or verbally abuse them. Um, but it takes time. So there's that patience part. There's also the compassion part because we're understanding of what they've gone through. Mm-hmm. So we need to, that those first few days and week, the best thing foster parents can give these children is the gift of time. Take them time to, to adjust, time to trust, time to cry, if you will, time to be angry, because they're, sometimes they're full of anger, um, or they may have their own guilt. They might think it's their fault. They may be angry with the system. They may be angry at the caseworker. They may be angry at their birth parents. Um, so again, there, it's a lot of patience, and that's where the unconditional love comes in as well. You know, you can yell at me so many times, but I'm still going to love you. You can call me whatever name mm-hmm. the, you want. I'm still going to love you. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, but it can be tough to be sure. Mm-hmm. And talking about the transitioning process, um, what's the process of transitioning a foster child to permanent placements or even the reunification of their biological families, how does that sort of transition take place? Well, it's different for every family, different for each child, because every family is different and unique. But normally, or generally, if you will, the family has to do a number of courses, parenting courses. They've got to have a background check. They've got to have a stable job, drug testing, all those things in order for unification to happen. And for some, it might be happening rather quickly. For some, it might be quite a while. And for those children who are unable to go back home because their family members were never able to to um, make that reunification possible, then what's known as termination of parental rights, TPR, which means their parental rights have been terminated by the court system, by a judge. Then a child's open up for adoption. And the adoption process looks somewhat like this. The child welfare program will do a search for any biological family members who might wish to adopt the child, whether it's grandparents, aunts, uncles, co-hosts, cousins, older siblings, whatever it might be. If there's no one willing to adopt the child, then the child is often up for adoption for the foster parents. Uh, and that's how we were able to adopt three from foster care selves. Wow, that's that's amazing. The process seems very... Um... I mean, the system that's in place seems very stern in sort of trying to keep the welfare of the child as best at heart. How much of a say does the child sort of have in terms of where they want to go, where what kind of um, permanent situation they want to be in? Very little. Because the child does not have a say of being removed from the home. The child does not have a say of being removed from their moms, their dads, maybe even their siblings. A child does not have a say of being placed into a foster care home with these strangers. A child does not have a say of being placed into a new school system mm-hmm. where they struggle mightily. In fact, they're 18 months behind academically on average. Um, so they don't really get that much say, but as they get older, as they get mm-hmm. older and um, you know the possibility of adoption might come up, well, then they can have a say in that. Perhaps they know somebody that they could that might want to adopt them, maybe an older a former teacher or somebody at church or a former foster parent or caseworker. So sometimes that's taken into consideration 
but many times um, the child's wishes are not sadly heard. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, it seems very, um, it seems very situational in terms of each child and how the child feels. And because I know a lot of um, permanent situations are probably less uh, enthusiastic by the child that's sort of at hand. And again, I only have film, unfortunately, as a term of reference, but just from what I understand of it, it seems like a very good system in place that sort of takes care of the child's well-being with them not really knowing what they possibly need as well. Yeah, that's generally true. Um, but, you know, it really is different for every child, and the system is not a perfect one anyways. But I will also state that uh, the media really does portray it uh, incorrectly. Mm -hmm. It's glorified. Okay. You know, it's Hollywood. It's so it's glorified. And, and yes. Not, yeah. Yeah. And how would you go ahead and try to change? I mean, you're working in so many different ways to try to change that understanding and try to not make the way that the media sees as someone's only point of reference. But what other things could we be doing as a society, as a community, in terms of trying to change that perspective of how someone like me, unfortunately, sees foster care and so, or other people sort of see how foster care is? Well, you know, I wrote my book, Fostering Love, One Foster Parent's Journey, really to bring awareness to people who are not foster parents. I did my TED Talk for the same reason, to bring awareness, because I think awareness equals advocacy. Not everybody can be a foster parent. It's the hardest thing I've done. It's the most rewarding thing I've done, but it's the hardest thing I've done. But all, at the same time, everybody can help a child in crisis in some way where they live. So first thing I would suggest is find out as much information as you can, bring awareness to yourself so you can become a better advocate for these kids, whether you're bringing them into your home or whether you're donating school bag, uh, backpacks filled with school supplies or hygiene items, whether you're providing meals to foster families in your area or adopting a child, if you will, during the holidays where you're providing some gifts at Christmas time or birthdays. If you have your own business, maybe hiring some of the youth in foster care to teach them some important social skills, communication skills, work skills, living skills. Um, there's so many ways people can be an advocate for these children without bringing them into their home. Mm -hmm. It sounds like something that definitely needs to be made more aware of. And I think a lot of people, I think their only way that they would know what foster care and how the system goes is if they search for it. It's not something that's sort of widely seen as a normal system. It's something that's so, um, so opportunistic as well in terms of how it comes around. So yes, I think talking about it today definitely brings awareness to me as well. I think I'm going to definitely go home and search up some foster donation areas because I think it's such a, it's such a huge thing that's not widely talked about, unfortunately. It isn't talked about because it makes us feel uncomfortable. It's not talked mm -hmm. about because we don't want to, we don't want to address it. It makes us feel uncomfortable, so we ignore it. We talk about something else instead that makes us feel better. And as a result, these children are suffering. You know, these, these, again, these children are not, these are not bad kids. These are children who are victims of abuse, neglect, abandonment, and they just want someone to love them. That's really, that's really what it boils down to. They have mm -hmm. people don't recognize that. Or they say, oh, I can't, I'm too busy, I can't, I have this or that, um, I don't want to get involved. So, yeah, yeah that's sadly, that's the, that's the case. Yeah, it's, I think especially when in terms of how people define their, um, define what family is and what children are to them, I think a lot of people are stuck on that biological children ideology, which is which is so 20 years ago, I think, in terms of what we see families and how the family dynamics are now. Right, right. So now we're going into the practice and habit part of the show. And it's just a, I know we've spoken a lot about how your family functions and different situations that your family can find yourself in. But as an expert in foster care, what are some of the practices that you take to improve a relationship when deciding to foster a child? 
Well, learning never stops. So I'm always trying to learn because when a child comes in our house, they're going to have some type of anxiety, some type of disability, if you will, some type of disorder. So I'm always researching, always learning so I can be better prepared and better equipped to provide the support services that child truly and desperately needs. So, you know, at 60 plus kids, that means there's 60 different ways of parenting. It's never the same, never the same. Um, you always have to adjust. You got to be flexible. What one what worked with one child is not going to work with another child uh, in so many different ways. And these children are all coming from various backgrounds. Um, and so many times they they are not familiar with the traditional household setting, if you will. You know, they're not familiar with what does a healthy diet look like? Why is it important to go to school? What does unconditional love really mean? What does consistency look like or what a structure look like? What does it mean to sleep safely in your bed seven nights a week without getting hurt? Um, so, you know, it's always adapting to the child's needs. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the challenges that you go through when going through the practice of improving a family relationship with sort of the blending of both different types of children. I go back to the trust. That's such a difficult thing because for some of these kids, they, they don't trust and they don't want to trust. They don't want to trust because they've been betrayed so many times by so many different adults in their lives. Those people who profess to protect them and love them have betrayed them in some way. So they don't trust adults and, and they, they probably should not because they've been hurt so many times. So that's difficult. Um, you know, also it's difficult having a child come to your home with these disorders and these anxieties that that you might not be familiar with. So you're you're suddenly trying to catch up and learn, hey, gosh, what 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 is what is going on with this child? Why are they behaving this way? Oh, now I see why they're behaving this way. Now I see some of the signs and symptoms. Now how can I best help and address address it? Um, that's challenging. Um, you know, just just the day-to-day -day routine can be tough. Let me tell you, when you get all these kids got to get to school in the morning, it's um, that's tough too. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not enough hours in the day. There's not enough hours in the day. My wife and I often fall into bed at night completely exhausted. <laughs> yeah, no, I can, I can definitely understand that. Um, so what kind of activities do you usually try to do as a family to sort of gain trust and, and sort of gain the idea of what a family should look like with those children. We play these games together. We have dinner together without social media. Well, in fact, at dinner time, we have a, uh, a game, if you will, where we pull out this deck of cards and they're just full of questions. So we're always asking questions to engage in conversation and get thinking process involved with the kids. You know, we're, we're teaching them new skills. You know, where they, when they come to our house, when they hit age 10, they're doing their own laundry. They're doing their own cleaning. Uh, they're learning how to cook at an early age, maybe eight or nine years of age, we're going to start introducing them to cooking eggs or making sandwiches, that type of thing. Um, we're always trying to teach them new skills, um, lots of games, lots of family activities. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the type of thing. And that, and that helps build trust, that helps build attachment, that helps build relationships, that helps build communication skills, and so much more. Do you usually set up a certain time to be playing the games as well? Is there a certain that they sort of expect in the routine? Well, we have game days. And then, of course, at dinner time, we're also having these questions as well. Um, you know, it, it, it depends. I should, I, it's hard to say this, but sometimes it depends on how many kids are in the house. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, if I have seven in diapers, probably a lot of my time to be spending diapers, changing diapers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or feeding babies, so you know. But we try to make a game out of everything. You know, we try to try to have a an environment of fun, an environment that's filled with joy. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's amazing. It's amazing to see um, for them to also see what a family is supposed to look like in terms of um, the amount of care, amount of love that should be expected from two adults that are. So it's supposed to be looking after them. So it's nice to see that they have that, um, they have that view as well. 
Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. It's always discovery. We're always trying to teach kids new things. And, you know, we often tell them to go outside and play. And, you know, right now in my house, there's two baby rabbits. There's four baby kittens. We've got baby chickens right now. Boy, what else do we have? And they're taking care of those animals. They're learning new skills, but they're taking care of those animals. And that that helps nurturing and healing as well. So it's, um, again, it's constant. Just try to be a positive, joy-filled, love-filled environment where they they can feel comfortable in experience trying new things and learning new skills. Mm -hmm. And how do you think that this habit, this practice, the routine um, has impacted your perception as to what family and life is supposed to look like? Well, I've had 60 plus kids come through my home. So my, my heart is, I've learned to love so much more. I've learned to be so much more compassionate. I believe I'm a better person, better husband, better father, better member of the community from all these children who come through my home. Um, just grateful for the opportunity to to have the opportunity to, to love these kids, mm-hmm. these kids. And what what kind of person would you recommend the whole idea of fostering for? Like you said, it's not for every every person. It's not for every individual. So what kind of person is sort of the best description of a foster parent somebody who really wants to help a child in crisis and is really willing to open up their heart as well as their home Mm -hmm. for a child in crisis okay that's a that's a very good definition it's not an easy easy definition to be able to fulfill as well so it's nice and descriptive thank you thank you We've got some questions from audiences that were sent to us, and there are quite a few of them. I think some of them I mentioned a little bit earlier, so I'll try to keep them in a less of a repetitive stream. So number one is, how do you handle the emotional challenges that come with fostering? You have to allow yourself time to grieve when a child leaves your home. You have to allow yourself to open up your heart for these children. You know, a foster parent's heart is a lot like a quilt with all these patches all over it because um, it's it's hard when a child leaves your home for whatever reason it might be. Um, so that, you know, those are really the basic, the, the, the really the biggest emotional challenges are that broken heart. Um, yeah, I mean, it can also be frustrating. Sometimes it's frustrating seeing a, seeing a court make a decision that you don't necessarily agree with for the child's benefit. Um, it can be frustrating watching a child uh, struggle in school and there's not much you can do to help that child. It can be frustrating sometimes watching a child not being able to trust somebody um, because they've been hurt so much. You know, that's all very sad. So. Lots of times foster parenting is a very, emo- it's an emotional job. I don't want to even say it's a job. It's an emotional lifestyle. It's a very emotional lifestyle because when the kids come to our home, they just need someone to love them. That's what they mm-hmm. need. So there is very much an emotional investment in these children. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's hard not to, I guess, with every child that sort of comes in and dealing with that. You must, the emotional strength to be able to, know that they're going into a better situation must be, um, no, I could not imagine it. But I think the reward that sort of comes with it is also also pretty incredible. Um, this is a pretty interesting question. What's some of the memorable success stories that, from your experience as a foster parent? Watching a child learn how to smile for the very first time after four years of abuse. Watching a child learn how to trust somebody watching a child learn how to laugh the very first time, watching a child go off to college and become a success. Only 6% go to college, only 2% graduate with a four-year degree. 55% drop out of high school. Um, those are some of the successes. Um, having a child um, say, I love you, that's so rewarding. There's so many rewards. You know, I think back to a couple of Christmases ago, we had 20 plus kids come to our through our home during the Christmas holidays, just coming back to visit the family. Wow, that I see the reward that sort of comes with it is is incredible. I 
the amount of times that um, I speak about this with a lot of my um, friends, as I've mentioned, and I don't think they could ever understand the amount of love that sort of comes into fostering and even adoption to that extent as well. The amount of um, opportunity that you know that you're giving a child that's gone through so much already before you've even gotten to know them is, is amazing. So what is the typical duration of a foster placement? Well, again, it's, diff it's different for every child, but, you know, 18 months on, on average is 18 months, kind of the average, but it's different for a child. We've had children as young, as little as a day and as long as almost two years, sometimes four months, six months, nine months. It, again, it's different for every child because every child's got a different family situation. Sadly, some children will languish in foster care for their entire childhood. Wow. No, that that is um that isn't pretty amazing. Are there any situations that sort of gone ahead and gone throughout their whole until they're 18 years old? Many times, many times. Wow. They they age out of foster care or they transition out of foster care because nobody would adopt them. Mm -hmm. In the United States, there's about 120,000 kids in foster care a year who are for adoption who never get adopted. And that's mm -hmm. just tragic because every child deserves a family. Where will they go on Christmas Day? Who will sing on happy birthday? Who will call them um, and bring them chicken soup when they're sick? You know, every child deserves a family. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference between sort of the foster homes and the different sort of facilities that are out there for children, not sort of going into a house, but into like another facility? Well, there's, you know, foster care looks different uh, across the globe. For some children, they're going to be in a traditional foster care home like my own, my wife and I. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be a single foster parent. Sometimes it might be in a residential or therapeutical home. Some people refer to it as a group home, if you will. Mm -hmm. Those are usually for the children who have been in foster care longer and they've never been able to find permanency if you will uh, so yes there's 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 a couple different ways of doing foster care none of them are perfect and it's not a one-size-fits-all some children some children thrive with any traditional foster care setting some children thrive in what's known as kinship where they're living with a relative maybe a, an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent while their parents are are trying to work their caseload um uh, so when it's different for, it's different. And again, it's not a one size fits all. There's, there's a, a place for all the table, if you will. Mm -hmm. And is it more, the last question is, is it more likely for um, the foster care system to want to reunify um, the biological families rather than sort of put them straight up for adoption? That's the end goal. End goal is reunification. Mm-hmm. Is it always okay. the best way? No. 50% of kids are, are reunified. Other 50%, 20 to 30% come back into care because sometimes their family members were not ready yet. Maybe the families sink back their own addictions. But again, reunification could be wonderful and glorious, which means the families are reunified. And that's hopefully what it should be, you know. Um, <laughs> and that, and er, again, every child should have family. Mm -hmm. And just my own sort of question that sort of just snuck up on me there. Um, what's the difference between a child that's going out for fostering and gone out for adoption? So is there like a different stream that sort of goes through there when it terms of a child's well-being? Well, you know, if they're going through adoption through foster care, again, I point mm -hmm. back to that means the parents' rights have been terminated, termination of okay. parental rights. So they're, they're still in foster care, but they're looking for an adoptive family. Now, maybe that foster family will adopt them, or maybe they'll go to another foster family that will adopt them. Um, so they're still in foster care, but they're just waiting for that adoptive family. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, it's, it's so, there's such a different brass, and I know that we're coming up to close to the end of the show, so I think... There definitely needs to be a bigger talk on this and I definitely need to Google a whole lot more as to the different ways that this sort of goes about. Um, now we're coming up to the last section, which is the open mic. It gives you a chance to talk about anything that you're passionate about, 
anything that you want to share with the audience. So in the last like few minutes or so, I'll definitely give you that time to talk with the audience directly and sort of bring awareness to something that you would love to. Well, I go back to uh, what I said earlier. Not everybody can be a foster parent, but everybody can help in some way. As someone is listening to this this podcast right now, uh, there's a child near where they live, probably within a mile of their home that is being abused in some way, that's being neglected in some way, that's probably crying out or maybe even praying, somebody come, please help me. And we all have the opportunity to do so. Human trafficking is on the rise globally. Child abuse is on the rise. The real pandemic, the real pandemic is mental health issues for children. Um, and that all goes back to the fact that there is a child near where we live, maybe even our own family, maybe somebody related to us that we don't want to acknowledge or recognize or say something because it might we might embarrass somebody else or it might be wrong. Um, so we can all make a difference. And, and I want to say this, you know, um, I think back to the starfish story. Do you know the starfish story? Um, I don't think I'm familiar with it. Wonderful story, wonderful story. So the, the, briefly, there is a... Uh, a father and son are walking along the beach early one morning. The night before, there was a tremendous storm, tremendous storm. And that next morning, the beach is littered with starfish from one corner of the beach to the other. Thousands of starfish. And the sun is just starting to come up. And the starfish are starting to cook and, and die from the heat. Well, the son bends down and he picks up a starfish and he throws it in the ocean as far as he can. He picks up another starfish and throws it as far as he can in the ocean picks up a third starfish and throws in the ocean. He's doing this for a while, and his father's just watching him. After a while, the father says, Son, look at all these starfish. You can't make a difference. And the son thinks about it. He bends back down, throws a starfish in the ocean, and said, I made a difference for that one. And that's what it's like for these children. There are so many children in need and in crisis. And while I can't change the world and you can't change the world for these children that we we help, their world is changed. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is that is an amazing connection to to that story, and just sort of to visualize the impact that um, that foster parents have on every child that sort of comes through. Just, I mean, you're right; you can't change the world, but you can definitely change the whole world of one person. And I think you don't know what that one person is capable of straight afterwards. So, you no, know, that's an amazing opportunity as well. So right. I, I definitely want to thank you, John, for coming on to the show and talking about foster care, talk, talking about ch child well-being and bringing us all awareness to it. And I think um, I hope a lot of us are Googling different ways that you can sort of support foster carers and in different ways, not only by bringing them into your home, but like you said earlier, just donating little things that you can um, in terms of making a child a little bit happier and bringing the well-being of a child a little bit easier as well. So I'm actually, I Googled it straight now. So I'm on three different sites at the moment trying to see um, as we're talking about this now. So that's that's amazing. Check out the Foster Care Institute as well, my website, the Foster Care Institute. There's so much information there for people who are curious about foster parenting and adoption, questions, who are considering it, or those who have been doing it for some time. Articles, webinars, podcasts, videos, you name it, it's all there. Okay, perfect. I was just going to ask... Um, for that website, because I know that a lot of people are going to be wanting to know. And if there's a way that they can contact you, is it through that website as well? Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Okay, so perfect. So if you want to contact John even further and sort of get to know, talk about him a little bit more, if there's something that I've missed, um, you can either comment down in, if you're watching on YouTube, you can comment down below or you can message him directly. Uh, either way, the messages will go straight to him. So hopefully that we get to find out a little bit more. Um, so yes, thank you so much, John, for joining me and for being on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes. And I hope that you and your family are doing amazing and you still keep doing the amazing work that you've done for more than 20 years. So thank you so much for helping a lot of kids out there. Thank you.
Okay. And yes, so I will see you guys next time on the show. Um, everything is down below. If you want to check out John's website or if you want to see even more episodes from us, uh, definitely go down below. So yes, thank you guys so much for listening and I'll see you guys in the next episode. You've been listening to All Together, the Family Science Insights podcast produced by Family Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at fa.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent, and thanks for tuning in.